Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with a word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. Today we're in Mark chapter 11, beginning this chapter, and the Lord Jesus and the disciples are coming up to Jerusalem for the last time prior to the crucifixion. So we read in verse 1, Mark 11 and verse 1, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you've entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of them who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of, our, of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem into the temple, so when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now it's interesting that as the Lord approaches Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit has Mark here put a story about their entrance into the town that reinforces for us that the Lord was not going there according to the will of man. He wasn't, in other words, just going up in ignorance of what was about to happen. The crucifixion was not an accident of history. It was the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that the Lord Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, should go and offer himself as a sacrifice there. Uh, the Lord knew everything that was going to transpire, even all the evil that men intended against him. And as he's going up, he's in perfect control as well as perfect foreknowledge of what's going to happen. So he sends two of his disciples, again sending out by two official emissaries, and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you've entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has set. Loose it and bring it, and if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. And the Lord here is speaking with perfect authority, not only delineating what they will find when they get there, but how they should act. Uh, when the people question them. And it's with that authority. There's no question of the people releasing the cult to him. He says immediately he'll send it here. And they go in verse 4 and find it precisely as the Lord had said. And as they were loosing it, some of those who stood there said, What are you doing loosing the cult? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. So we see the authority of the Lord Jesus. Here's the perfect servant of the Lord in submission to his father and doing his father's will. But when one is acting in submission to the authority of God, that brings its own authority. You have the weight of God's command, of what God has told you to do, and God can carry through what he's told you to do. In other words, he brings to pass what he wants to through your action. Now, they treat the Lord like a king. They bring that colt. They throw their clothes on it, and he sat on them, and many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down the leafy branches, what people commonly call Palm Sunday here, uh, that we're remembering what the Lord Jesus did. But it's reminiscent of things we see in the Old Testament as well, such as when Jehu was proclaimed king over Israel, and that the men with him put down their clothes, and people put down uh, they're basically rolling out the red carpet, we might say. They're, they're making a way for the Lord to come and showing their receptivity to him. And we have those that are going before him, crying out, Hosanna, which this is a quotation from the 118th Psalm, a psalm about Messiah. And Hosanna is an ejaculation. It's a, an expostulation of man where they say, uh, save now. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So here they're looking at the Lord and they're addressing him in messianic terms. Now it's a question of what they thought the Lord was going to do. You notice in verse 10 they 
reference the kingdom of our father David. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David. They're thinking about the Davidic covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel 7, those promises to always have a son on his throne and to rule forever through uh, that seed that was to come from David. And we have Psalms like Psalm 89. That's a commentary on that and how this king one day is going to come and rule and reign in glory. We've seen already in Mark in the last chapter, and the one before it as well, that the apostles had this mindset that the glory was right around the corner, that the Lord was going to come and set up his kingdom by force, that the Lord was going to topple Rome and cast them out, and that he was going to rule and reign in glory. And undoubtedly, one day the Lord Jesus is going to come and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So says many books of the Bible, especially uh, Revelation 19 and onwards. The kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, as Revelation says earlier. And so the Lord is going to rule and he is going to reign over the earth. And he is going to sit on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. But the problem is... He was coming then not to rule and reign. He was coming to die. He was coming to suffer. He was coming to fulfill all those messianic prophecies that talked about Messiah being rejected and delivered up to be killed. In fact, the very Psalm, Psalm 118, that speaks about this glorious reign on the throne of his father David is the same Psalm that talks about binding the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Now, the only passage I can think of I think I'm correct in saying that the only place the Bible speaks about a sacrifice being bound to the altar is in the case of Isaac in Genesis 22, who was bound on an altar on Mount Moriah. And in that very same area, the Lord Jesus, these millennia later, was going to be nailed to a cross. That was going to become an altar as the Lord would be offered up by the eternal spirit, according to Hebrews 9.14, and give his life a ransom for many, as we read in Mark 10.45. He was going to pay that price to free us from sin. He was going to become the propitiation that enables God to be just and yet the justifier of the one believing in Jesus. That if we have faith in him, God can give us the very righteousness of God applied to our account. And the Lord, our substitute, took our curse. He was made a curse for us, as Galatians 3 points out to us, by dying on the cross. He was, of course, raised up by the glory of the Father and eventually received up into glory, where he now sits on the right hand of the majesty on high. So they were still thinking the glory was now, that the Lord was coming to be coronated very soon or have his coronation very soon, be crowned very soon, let's say, in Jerusalem. And yet the Lord was going on to suffer and to die, and he knew this all along. But there was this expectation of the people that the kingdom would come. And it, of course, begs the question, what really are we expecting from the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, many people seek God, so they say, and they come to the Lord Jesus. And today we hear much about people saying, well, you know, there's a lot of problems in my life. I don't feel good about myself. So I come to Jesus because I want to feel better about myself. Or I come to the Lord Jesus because I have marital problems. I want my marriage to be better. Or I come to the Lord Jesus and I want him to help me with my business problems. I'm near bankruptcy or whatever the case may be. You know, the Lord Jesus certainly can help us in whatever problem we have. But I'll tell you why the Lord Jesus came. The Lord Jesus came to suffer and die in our place as the only sacrifice for sin. And he came to save us out of our sin unto the world to come. In other words, to translate us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of His love, from that rule of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of His love, as Colossians 1 speaks about in verse 12. And the Lord Jesus is the one who wants to not only come in and help us or kind of be our, our friend who will be with us and make us feel good or something like that. The Lord actually wants to transform us to turn us from being those who were broken and twisted and perverted by sin and those who are under a sentence of condemnation to actually declare us justified, now not condemned, but instead the opposite, declared righteous. And he wants to give us that life, which is life eternal, because it's the life 
that is a relationship with God. It's walking with God. Yes, having the Lord Jesus as our friend and as our brother, he's not ashamed to call us brethren, but also as our Lord and master, whom we bow to and say, Lord, make my life what you want it to be. Work inside of me. Change my heart and mind to love what you love and hate what you hate and to be godly in my way of behavior, to speak like the Lord Jesus would have me speak and like the Father wants me to speak, to act like the Father wants me to act. And that's a lifelong procedure. When the Lord saves us, he begins to do a good work in us. And Paul tells us in Philippians 1, by the Spirit of God, of course, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it under the day of Christ Jesus. So he's not coming to save us from our temporal problems, from the troubles we have in this world. Yes, we will be saved from this world one day. But what he wants to do is save us from the penalty of our sins, which is being separated from God for all eternity and bearing the wrath that he took in our place. He wants to save us from that. He also wants to save us from the power of sin so that we're no longer slaves of sin, but that we're free to follow the Lord and serve him and please him and worship him. And he wants to save us ultimately out of the presence of sin, out of this world of sin where it's fallen and things aren't done God's way. He wants to save us to life forever in the Father's house, a relationship in the family of God and co-heirship and co-sonship with the Lord where we rule and reign with him by his grace. This is our Savior. And one day Israel is going to be able to proclaim Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But as our Lord said at the end of Matthew 23, when he looked over Jerusalem and wept that same last week, the same time period that Mark is relating, and the Lord knew that Jerusalem was going to suffer many things because they weren't receiving him. He said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the last time they saw him, he was going out of the city rejected by them to die on a cross, to die not only as a felon, but as the worst of the worst kind of criminals. The very lowest dregs of humanity were crucified and considered accursed by the Jewish people. So that's how Israel saw Jesus of Nazareth the last time. But the next time he comes, the remnant of Israel at the end of the tribulation will look up and see the Lord coming with clouds and the power of the authority uh, of the majesty on high. And they will look on him whom they pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And then they're going to say, Hosanna. Not because they want to be saved from the Roman Empire alone or their temporal troubles alone, but they want to be saved from certain death that's surrounding them at that moment and saved to heaven and to the kingdom that God has promised them from the days of their ancestors, even from the days of patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So may God give us joy. May we indeed want the Lord for the right reasons, not just to give us a, a good life now. If we come to the Lord, our life may become terrible. We may suffer for him. We will suffer for him if we're loyal to him. We will suffer persecution. Second Timothy 3.12 tells us all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom, Acts 14 says. And the apostles all suffered either exile or death. And the early church knew that there would be suffering entailed with following the Lord. In fact, in the second century, a Christian quoted the pagans as saying, behold how they love one another. Behold how they die for one another. So to become a Christian means you're not going to win popularity contests in this world. You're not going to be received by this world because just as they hated the Lord Jesus and gave him a cross, they're going to do the same to you if they can. And the Lord promises, however, that whatever you suffer, he'll never leave or forsake you. He'll be with you every moment and he'll carry you through and deliver you home to heaven because no one can lay a charge against God's elect. He's the one who justifies. No one can condemn us. No one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Read Romans 8 on that. Now the Lord went into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, he doesn't stay in Jerusalem. He goes back out. He goes nearby to Bethany with the twelve. This is the place where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived, his friends. And we don't read about the Lord other than perhaps implied when he was twelve and left in the temple inadvertently by Joseph and Mary. 
we don't read about him spending the night in Jerusalem. It was a city that was not commodious for the Lord. It was inconducive to the work he was doing. What he found in Jerusalem was opposition and rejection and hypocrisy and pride. And uh, the Lord never felt comfortable there. And it's a sad thing because Psalm 48 calls Jerusalem the city of the great king. And yet here's the king in their midst and they don't even recognize it. And they're going to reject him and kill him. So we have to look beyond man's way of seeing things. And we have to have this divine perspective that sees the Lord Jesus for who he is. The son of God who came as the son of man, the Messiah, to save us from our sins. Not just make this a better world, but actually deliver us from this world that God says is condemned already. And bring in a better world wherein dwells righteousness, even new heavens and a new earth, according to Second Peter 3. May God help you and encourage you today. Thank you.